sci-fi and fantasy short stories. God Seeking Internship Opportunities by Jeff Baldwin I am God. Well, uh, I'm a minor god. New divinity, as they say. Not the most widely worshipped, but I have my flock. I was an idol. Not exactly false, but not well respected. A handful of people prayed to me behind closed doors. Some kept idols stuffed in the bottom of their wardrobes, or etched my name in dark corners where your eyes were not prone to wandering. There were a few groups of women who'd head out into the woods and dance naked while chanting my name. I liked that. I'm an omnipotent, non-sexual being, but still. Then, not long ago, uh, 20,000 years at most, some guy who was a fan of mine convinced some other people I was all right. He even got them to worship me, and to die for me if necessary. It wasn't necessary, actually, uh, but this man didn't see it that way. And through my name, he gained power over a small region. It isn't the biggest or most fertile land, but I guess I shouldn't complain. He ruled over this region for a while, absorbing power, collecting tributes, hoarding concubines. I didn't much mind. If I'm honest... I'd enjoyed my little foothold in the universe. This man begat a son who was able to hold on to this small kingdom, and the son begat another son who expanded into nearby territories, leaving fire, blood, and fatherless babies in his trail. I guess I expected it to go on like this. Maybe I was supposed to watch over things a bit more, the hand of this particular god was a bit apathetic to the whims of men, I'm embarrassed to say. Before long, there were cracks. Sons of sons bickering over lands. Merchants became wealthy. Then they became lords. Power was hoarded. Power was lost. And where was I? Soaking up the reverence. Being a god can be pretty neat, okay? Once I started paying attention, there were five separate kingdoms where once there was one. Whoops. So, I made a new millennium's resolution. I'm taking a hands-on approach. Two kings have marched shiny, ironclad armies of men, wielding swords and spears and other pointy things into a wide valley. This battle will decide a three-year-long war. I was having a bath and missed most of it. Both kings pray to me for guidance, for strength, but mainly for victory. They tell their followers the men across the battle lines are heathens for celebrating my glory in slightly different ways. I'm actually not that picky. Brought the seventh, ruling king in East Zambia, Loves to slaughter goats in my name, and have his priests, my priests technically, pour sour wine over his head, coating his face red before his men. The heads of families do this during holiday feasts in East Zambia as well. These rituals, passed down from cleric to cleric for generations, are held sacred. They also build large houses of worship, requiring the common folk to giveth a percentage of their livestock precious metals, or whatever else they own. I'm given to believe this is a common practice. Genesai, the kingling whose legs are dangling off an overbearing throne in tall Lachi, is currently being ushered along by his uncle Gabai. That's the guy who really holds the big stick, though I bet both of their heads will likely be fitted for spikes if they lose the upcoming battle. They have priestesses in Talashi, very progressive. Front the Seventh has another word for it. They also frown upon the killing of innocent animals for waste, eating all parts of any beast, even the gross bits. They do march their dead to the top of the highest mountain in their small kingdom, slice the bodies into pieces, and allow the birds to feast upon them. Something about being closer to me... 
Uh, I find it all a tad icky, but sometimes it's the thought that counts. The powerful men from both of these small pieces of grass and dirt claim to want to rid the other of their barbaric ways. Bront the Seventh spreads rumors to anybody who will listen, a lot of people when there's a crown on your head, that Genocide's mother is besought with demons, and that he has unnatural relations with Gabai behind closed doors. I happen to be good friends with a few demons. They aren't opposed to entering the body of a woman, but generally take the shape of a man first. It's also well known in the villages of Tailashi that Bront the Seventh and the wealthy members of his court sodomize the goats before sacrificing them, and that the wine they pour over their heads is mostly the blood and urine from small boys. I have to give these people credit. They know how to sully a man's good name. And sure, after this battle, the winning side will certainly force the commoners on the losing side to adapt their rites and rituals, or at least meet halfway. All in due time. But that's not why they were at war. They've decided to let these men die to claim the rights to a bit of land with a river running through it. The river is muddy and slow, but accessible by ship with small cities along it, rich from trade with people who worship other gods. Maybe I should ask one of them for some advice. No, I just need to take a little initiative, that's all. A bit more shepherd and a bit less lamb. I could whisper kind words in the ears of the men below. Encourage them to declare a truce and split access to the river. They'd marry sons to daughters, and this truce might see fifty years. But why put off until tomorrow? No, this is a squabble better settled. But who is better fit to rule? I figure the best way to determine who should win this battle, and therefore control of a larger chunk of the realm is to test the spirits of the men who wish to plant their flags upon my soil. Flipping the proverbial coin, the men of Tailashi will be given the first opportunity to bear their souls. I shall weigh their hearts against a feather. And if that fails, eh, try to find out if they act like dicks. To do this, I'll need to stretch my consciousness a bit. It sounds difficult, but the concept of some actions being harder than others renders godliness a bit useless, doesn't it? No. In fact, I'll simply be performing a play where I am cast as both lead roles and that of the MacGuffin. Enter stage left. A woman played, of course, by me in tattered rags and reeking of the filth that embodies a camp populated by makeshift soldiers. She approaches the courtyard, where those of importance have their tents, some as large as small castles, and where she hopes her pleas might be heard. Another woman follows her at a clipped pace. It's me again, and my skin is now smooth, and my gown made of soft, expensive textiles. She belongs in a tent like this one, though her personal tent is overseen by her merchant husband, whose small private army is on loan to the court of Talashi. They left their comfortable estate to follow the battles as a constant reminder of the debt they are to be owed, and of course, to be in a good position to switch sides and use their considerable resources to help propel another would-be ruler if tides begin to change. All for a price, of course. The trick, if I understand it, is to become rich enough to bet on both horses. There's one more actor in this play. This one's crying. That's not abnormal. He is a baby. Don't worry, he's me as well. Finally, playing the part of himself... Go by arrives, carrying a roll of papers and sits on an ornate bench adjacent to the throne intended for young Genesi. Speak, he says, not bothering to look up from his scroll. And quickly, there are more important squabbles about. M my lord, 
The poor woman stammers. He is the king regent, not the king, scoffs the rich woman. I am Gabai Gakari, uncle and hand to King Genocide Gakari, and regent of Tolashi until the 14th anniversary of the king's birth. His voice rose as he spoke and was punctuated by a short growl. Plead your petty case or be gone now. Okay, points off for good manners and patience, if I'm being honest. Though he does know how to command a room. I noticed more than a few guards' knees looking less than stable, but I'm not here to determine how well he can talk down to his subordinates. I'm here to see if his judgment is fair. My lord, begins the poor woman, this here child before you is of me body. Not yet four months and hungers for me milk. Three days past, this woman came in with two men. They had swords, my lord, and armor. They took him from his cradle and left me face bloody for protesting. A filthy lie from a filthy peasant, my honorable king regent, the rich woman says, making a polite curtsy as she spoke and keeping her head down. This woman snuck into the private tent of my fine husband's, whose men go around not stealing babies from the wretched camp-following whores like this one, but rather taking arms for your noble cause. Gabai opens his mouth to speak, then pauses and takes a deep breath. He looks over at the guard next to him, who seems more tin sculpture than man. Fetch the young king. This will be an opportunity for him to learn where the ideals of firmness and fairness cross paths. The guard seems first not to have heard Gabai. The ornate helm covering his face didn't move as he was spoken to, but after a second, he slams the butt of a long axe onto the floor twice, making a dull thud. And the gesture probably intimidates people a lot more when done on the stone floor of a castle. The dirt floor here has been covered by soft rugs, but that doesn't help with the acoustics. Still, the armored guard makes a scene of his exit, with stomps and turns. I must say, humans put a lot of time into ritual and pageantry. If I ever set down a holy text, I think I'll title it Less is More. After a long wait, a small boy in a green silk shirt comes into the room. He looks to have been dragged here straight from his bed, and his curled hair is sticking out at the sides. I don't want to meet with the council today, uncle, he whines as he rubs his eyes with his bald hands. Genesai, one day you will sit on this throne and rule over our land. How can you learn to do that by sleeping past noon? The king hops onto the throne, which towers over him. He slumps his head to the side and rests it on his arms. His mouth gapes open, and I'm waiting for drool to form. Now, why should I believe either of you? Gabai asks, fixing his gaze on the two women. I make milk for him, my lord. Many whores can perform that trick after they've dumped another whelp on the side of the road. It's lies, my lord. The baby comes from my own loins, and the seed of his father, my husband, whose men will bravely fight for you tomorrow, my honorable regent. Enough, Gabai says, and peers at the rich woman. If this is your son, how has it come to pass that this woman is making claim to him? She dressed as one of the servants in our service, the woman begins, though all she truly serviced was every man in our company who would throw her a coin for her effort. It's not true, my lord. I ain't never seen her till she comes to me camp and takes me boy. Gamai's eyes go back and forth and creep sideways to peek at Genesai, who is busy looking at his thumbs. Hmm. The solution is simple, he finally says. I cannot ascertain who among you is telling the truth. Therefore, you both have claimed this child. My king regent, if you are suggesting we share the raising of this child, I must... You must learn to listen to the king's regent while he is speaking. The rich woman takes a step back and bows her head low. 
As I was saying, the decision is simple. The baby will be split in two, and each of you will be entitled to half. Genesai suddenly looks up, and something hooks the left corner of his mouth into a wry smile. He looks up to his uncle, then peers down at the crying baby. No, my lord, you can't do... You will find there is little I can't do, peasant. I get the head, the rich lady says, crossing her arms. No, my lord, I lied. Truly, I did. He's not my own son. I swear it. She tells it true, my lord. I took him when she went looking. Stole him from his crib, I did. See, my most honorable king regent, it is just as I said. Yes, I do see now. I see very clearly who in this room is a mother and who is not. You, Gabai says, nodding to the poor woman. Take your child and find somewhere safer than a battlefield to raise him. What? Genesai says, managing to sound like a sword tip dragging across glass. But I want to see him cut it! Goodbye, sighs, putting his fingers on his temple and pressing hard. Genesai, did you not see the lesson here? Yeah, that dumb rich lady didn't know it was a trick, but I want to see him cut it. But you learned your lesson, yes? Uh-huh, yeah, I learned it. Fine, Goodbye says, and motions to the guard with the long axe with one hand. Before either woman could protest, he swings the axe through the cradle, taking the child at the midsection and covering both women in a wash of blood. Gabai's face lights up with wonder. Not a great start. Shame, too. I really thought I had something there. Hopefully, Bront VII is a man of rational stability and moral fortitude, or at the very least, doesn't chop babies in half. But that baby thing gives me an idea. Although, uh, maybe it would be best not to come as a lesser being, but a higher one, both physically and metaphysically. I find Bront VII not in an ostentatious tent surrounded by servants and concubines, but in a hastily constructed altar where he is bent over praying to me. Is it eavesdropping if I listen in? The conversation is intended for me anyways. I suppose not. So I glide down and land on his shoulder. Oh yeah, I'm a bird. Ah! Bront the Seventh cries. Shoo! Away! There are two guards outside the door leading into his room, but he is alone. One guard cranes his neck around the entrance, but quickly pulls it back after seeing the king is speaking to a common bird. I hover above the king for a second, then land on the altar. We're facing each other. Ugh, how can I keep vermin out of my... King Bront of East Zambia. I am no pest but a god among kings, I say without moving my beak, in a voice only Bront can hear. His eyes widen, and he falls back on his arm. Who, who are... I am the one you are praying to. The one who decides the fate of your kingdom with no more than a thought. For your kingdom is truly mine. I am here to answer your prayers. Be you worthy. Do gods really talk like this? I assume I'm the first god Bront has talked to, so maybe he won't know any difference? My lord... God among heaven and earth, is it really you? Question not my... Wait, seriously? I appeared as a freaking bird. What do you need? I apologize, my lord, Rant says and throws his arms out in front of his body, his head resting on the ground. I am unworthy of your presence. That's, uh, to be determined. After some careful instructions... Uh, Bront the Seventh meets me at the base of a mountain trail, bringing his only son, cleverly named Bront the Eighth, but henceforth will be referred to as that baby. Whether he managed to slip past his guards' watch or convince them of the importance of his quest, 
I don't really care enough to review the tape. I guess I could ask him, but no. Let's get on with it. Your child looks healthy. He nourishes in the worship of your divine spirit, my lord. And food, right? You do feed him? Of course, my lord. He eats not solid foods yet, but has an appetite. Follow me, I say. I fly ahead, allowing the two bronts to keep up as we head up the mountain, which is really an overgrown lump of rocks and dirt, but it'll have to do in terms of dramatic effect. We come to a small clearing with a view of Bront's camp. I stop and allow him to rest and catch his breath. You shed the blood of others in my name. Are you willing to shed your own blood? My lord, everything I am, I devote to you. I flutter over to a rock, landing next to a steel dagger that has been conveniently forgotten here. I ask that you shed your own blood, a symbol of the pain you might endure for me. He lifts the dagger, and without flinching, pricks his finger, causing a drop of blood to spill. Seriously? I ask. What? Oh, I apologize. How much blood will be necessary? It's just you didn't specify. Well, like, more than that. Uh, Cut your hand. Without pause, Bront clasps his hand around the blade and then slowly slides it out. His blood covers the knife and leaks under the dirt by his feet. Gross. Is this enough? Yes, yes. Ugh. You have proven yourself worthy of the next test. Are there many more? What do you mean? The tests. Uh, don't get me wrong. All my time on this earth, I devote to your service. But, you know, there is a battle tomorrow, my lord. <sighs> Consider deeply what will deliver victory to your soldiers tomorrow. My grace or your strategy? Without waiting for his reply, I continue up the mountain. Okay, this one's a bit dense, I'll admit that. But he certainly listens to me. He may not make the wittiest dinner guest, uh, but he's malleable in an idiot sort of way. After about an hour of walking, I notice the king is getting tired, which makes sense. The path is rough and he's carrying his only son, who looks small but has been crying and kicking through much of the journey. This is as good a place as any... I fly down and land on a narrow, barren branch of a dead tree. Beside the tree is a wild boar, about the size of two ponies tied together with thick rope, but much angrier. The beast has dark, scraggly fur and tusks the size of a child's arm. Bront falls backwards and starts to crawl away. Who do you fear more, king of men? You, you, my lord on high, uh, I, 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 I fear you above all. Ah! He screamed as the boar turned to face him, fifteen paces away at most. Oh, I fear you above all, my lord. Watching the urine stain the king's cambric pants, I doubted what he said was entirely true. Still, this isn't a test of honesty, but of courage. And what is courage if not bravery in the face of mortal danger? Stand, Bront. Hold close, your child. Fear not this boar, as I am master of man and beast. Stand. Bront rises to his feet. Though they wobble so wildly, I fear they might snap. The boar charges at the man and his child. Bront's eyes are mostly white, with a speck of color bouncing around in the middle. But he stands his ground. The boar stops, close enough for Bront to smell his breath. I see the king's chest heaving, and I worry I might kill the poor man by making his heart burst open. The boar reaches near Bront's shoulder in height. Bront closes his eyes. The boar circles the pair, twice, sniffs at Bront's crotch. Bront tightly clenches every bodily orifice I can see, 
and I assume the ones I can't see are even tighter. Open your eyes. Bront opens his eyes to see the beast is gone. Vanished, or walked down the hill out of sight. I'll let Bront decide when he retells the story. Certainly, I have proven myself. Is it the child who informs the teacher when he has learned his lesson? Yes, of course, my lord, uh, but... <sighs> Follow. I'll need to get better at parables, sure, but overall this is going pretty well. Then again, the last time I tested a man's spirit, he proved himself worthy right up until he cut a baby in half to amuse a petulant child. So let's not call the game at halftime. We walk for two more hours and reach the top of this mountain. Even in the form of a bird, I have to admit this is a nice view. But not to be distracted, I land near a thicket of dry sticks, curved into the form of a small cradle. How deep does your faith in me root? My faith runs, he begins. Catch your breath first, I say. Sorry. He leans over and pants heavily for a minute before looking back up. My faith runs from my skin to my core. I am nothing without my faith. Place your son in the thicket and grab the torch beside it, I say. Once the torch is in his hands, I light it in a small explosion, and it burns hot and bright. Take your son, your only son, Bront the Eighth, and offer him to me as burnt offering, as your priests in Zambia offer burnt goats. Bront obediently begins moving the torch near the child. He doesn't flinch, but his eyes are puffed out and starting to water. His hand begins to shake as he gets closer to the dry thicket, but he keeps moving forward. Right before he allows the flame to grab hold of the bramble cradle, I reveal myself in human form. I stand a head taller than the king, with shoulders like an eagle's wingspan, wavy blonde hair and abs like a newly cobbled street. I've been in a few human bodies now, and I'm god enough to admit I've discovered vanity. Stop. Lay down the torch and behold me. You have proven yourself worthy of my blessing. You faced the pain of a dagger. You revealed your faith in my power over beast. And here, you have proven yourself willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. Now I will be merciful. Your first child may live a long life and your triumph on the field of battle will be heralded. Glory will adorn you. Put down your torch, pick up your child, and lead your men to victory. Excuse me, what was that? Bront asks. Is that smoke I smell? I turn around to see flames licking the sky in a halo around where a once joyful child rested quietly. Oh, um, nothing. Never mind. Okay, have to go now, so, yeah, good luck tomorrow and all that jazz. Bront woke up two hours before dawn the next day and prayed until his men took the field. The battle wasn't swift, but in the end, goodbye of Talashi proved that pious devotion rarely defeats a few well-placed archers. I stayed out of the affair. I've decided to take a step back. I see two beggars arguing over a loaf of bread. I think this problem might be on my level. Demigod steps. Jeff is an English professor living in Gwangju, South Korea, who enjoys crafting stories that are weird, with a name for finding an audience who is even weirder. Hey guys, so I've always loved the idea that gods are just as fallible as people and some of them are complete idiots. <laughs> 
One of my favorite pantheons is definitely that of Terry Pratchett's Discworld. They definitely have their own personalities, their own quirks, and none of them are overly intelligent, from what I can recall. <laughs> if you guys did like this story, be sure to leave a thumbs up and a comment if you're on YouTube. Or if you're listening to the podcast, I could always use more reviews over on Apple Podcasts. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.